Hi guys, my name is Ryan Komet, uh, pen name Nom de Plume here, got hold Eisenstein, and I will be delivering the lecture series in mathematics for now. So, uh, mathematics is sometimes called the queen of sciences. This term was first used by the great German mathematician and physicist Carl Friedrich Gauss, uh, 1800s, and it's because mathematics is everywhere. It's in all of the other sciences, it's in everything in life, and, and it can be used to describe it beautifully. Um, you know, I think humans have always had this desire to number things. We've always liked counting and these symmetries, and mathematics for some reason is naturally appealing to our brains in, in, in this way. Um, and, and so I think that some of this cool stuff here is important um, for helping us understand what's going on around us um, through these numbers that we like. So, this series is going to cover a lot of stuff um, you haven't seen in school, um, that you probably won't see in school, unless you have a teacher who maybe goes off on a fun lecture one day or something like that. Um, the, the background assumed is at least geometry. Um, you, you, you can probably hang if you haven't had Algebra 2, um, because I will review concepts from Algebra 2. But geometry and Algebra 1, you need to have a very good background in to understand what we're going to go over here. Um, and, and unlike the other courses on the site, it's not intended to be introductory level material. It's intended to be a little more for the advanced student. So um, we're going to go over in this lecture a couple mathematical conventions, maybe do a proof just to get you used to my lecturing style. Um, and throughout the next couple of weeks, we'll really get into some heavy stuff. So let's start off with the number systems. Uh, kind of one of the foundational things in mathematics is the number systems. And the actual proofs and constructions of them is far, far too advanced to go into here. But what we are going to do is we're going to talk about what they are, how they're represented, um, because I will sometimes use these references throughout the course of this series. So, first one um, that you should all be familiar with, natural numbers, right? One, two, three, the counting numbers, the whole numbers, etc. Um, we denote this by this n with a line there. And then we have the integers, um, which is we're taking the natural number system, and this is true with all of these. We take the previous system, and we extend it. So we've taken the naturals, right? You see 1, 2, 3 still present there. But now we've added the zero number, first of all, and we've also added the negative side of the number line that you're all familiar with, I hope. Um, and so that's the naturals to the integers, and now let's extend that to the rationals. And by the way, the Z here with the line uh, comes from German, um, when the likes of Gauss and Riemann were using it. Uh, rational numbers, then, are the naturals, and the integers, and then we've added terminating decimals, so 0 0.5, 1 1.75, stuff like that, okay? Um, and any terminating decimal, no matter how many digits, so long as it terminates, can be included in the rationals. And, and in a way, you can even view the whole numbers as decimals that terminate w without going out to a tenths place, a hundredths place, something like that, right? Um, and these are Q, and that's from uh, Italian, um, and that was Piano, and he helped uh, set up arithmetic and stuff like that. And all these guys you hear me talking about now, you'll probably learn a lot more about in our uh, science history lectures later on. Um, then we have the final one, the final extension of the rationals is to the reals, and the reals include non-terminating decimals. So we've added in pi, for instance, right? Pi has been proved uh, to not ever terminate. It goes on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, 3.14159, so on. Um, and so we include this in the real numbers, and that's probably the highest number system we'll work with here. Okay? So, um, You'll see me most of the time just refer to them with these. I might say the name, but you'll see in writing generally the letter symbols for everything. All right? So the next thing I want to talk about is a proper mathematical proof. And we're going to start by proving that um, the prime numbers are infinite. And so you should all remember the prime numbers from school, right? We have 2, 3, 5, 7, um, and the definition of a prime number is it can't be factored down as a product of other numbers. Um, remember, products multiple. So, and, and if it's not prime, it's composite, and these are all products of other numbers. So 4 is 2 and 2, 6 is 2 and 3, 8 is 2 
times 2 times 2, right, because that gives you 4 times 2 is 8. 9 is uh, 3 times 3, stuff like that, okay? Um, so, we're trying to say, well, how many primes are there? Is there some greatest prime p sub g here? Um, we're going to denote primes p sub n, so 1, 2, 3, to the greatest prime p sub g. Is there some p sub g that exists such that every number after it is composite? that there are no longer unfactorable numbers. Um, and we're going to use a proof from the mathematician Euclid from antiquity, and uh, considered probably the greatest geometer in ancient Greece. His book, uh, The Elements, is considered the fundamental text in geometry which was used for thousands of years, I'd say. And we'll probably use that, actually, in other lectures. But his proof here is a method of either direct attack or contradiction, depending on who you listen to. I mean, this has been debated for a long time. I personally call it a proof by contradiction, though. So, first we start by taking a multiplicative series, so p sub 1 times p sub 2 times p sub 3, all the way to p sub g, the supposed greatest prime to exist, right? Um, and then we add 1 to it, we say that equals m. So that's the same, then, as m minus this multiplicative series, and I don't need the extra parentheses because order operations, right? So m minus this multiplicative series equals 1. Um, well, he, he, here's the deal. Um, we, we take this and we can examine it here, right? 2 times 3 is 6, plus 1 is 7. That's prime. Uh, 6 plus, or 6, let's go out. Okay, 2 times 3 times 5, so the multiplicative series of the first 3 primes is going to give us 30, plus 1 is 31, prime again. And so let's go back and look at this. Now, now we think we're getting this inkling from the work we've done, from analyzing it, that it's going to produce a prime, right? And well, you can look at this and you can say, well, heck, for that to be true, the new number would have to divide 1, because you're adding 1. You can say, okay, so this is a composite. And generally, the product of two primes is always a composite, right? Because that's what prime factorization is. Um, but then adding in this pesky 1, the, the new number would have to divide 1 for this to work, where this multiplicative sum of primes plus 1. And no prime number can divide 1, because we're saying the greatest prime to exist is 2. And 1 over 2 isn't going to give you a whole number, and it's not going to give you a prime. 1 can't be factored down. So... Therefore, there are an infinite number of prime numbers. I can never find a p sub g such that uh, this equation yields a composite. It's always going to yield a prime number. Okay? Um, so, while we're on the subject of primes, there's one more thing I just want to kind of cover on a tangent, because we're going to talk about it in another lecture, but you should be familiar with it now. It's called the twin prime conjecture. And this says that there are numbers like 3 and 5, both primes, that are two apart. 5 and 7 that are 2 apart, stuff like that. Well, the twin prime conjecture says there are also an infinite number of these. The problem is the twin prime conjecture hasn't been proved yet. Um, we've taken it to certain powers and, and we've done some work with it, but there, there's actually some stuff going on right now with Terence Tao, a great mathematician at UCLA, um, very close to a proof, they think. But it's certainly not using the elementary methods of this. So, kind of homework assignment here, um, call this the homework for the lecture, is try to apply this argument here, taking the multiplicative sum and, and adding one for the twin primes, and think about why you couldn't do it for the twin primes, why you can for the primes. Um, and that just kind of gets you in the analytical thinking that is mathematics, okay? So, now we're going to talk about a couple other proof types. Um, as far as mathematical proofs, though, we're pretty much done. Alright? So... Uh, other types of proofs that you might see in this are going to be, so we just did, we're, we're going to say contradiction. Alright, um, another one might be a direct proof by something like, so we're going to call it direct, and that's something like by substitution. Given the axioms of algebra, given what we already know about algebra, we can solve an equation for x such that we've proved what x is. Um, and that's why mathematics is axiomized. That's why we learn 
things like the transitive property, the commutative property, things like that, is because having those as a foundation means we say we assume these perform this operation and we've proved something. So you're solving the equation plus 5 for x, right? You, you, you could all prove x that it equal to 0, subtract the 5, divide by 2. So you, you prove x equals, oh my god, negative 5 halves. But th that's what a direct proof is. Um, then there's a really cool one called contrapositive. We're going to go over in a little detail here. And a contrapositive proof means A equals B is the same, alright, I'm going to use an equal sign actually, as saying that not B is not A. Alright, so the example I like to use for this is prove you aren't in London, or, or, or prove London is in England actually, right? Let's prove London is in England. So. Um, if being in London means being in England, then not being in England means you're not in London, doesn't it? Um, and that's what a proof by contrapositive is. <coughs> is um, you show not B, and that implies not A. Um, and, and oftentimes, these kind of proofs by implication here are, are the best thing we have. Um, there's also one called infinite descent that we will be going over probably next lecture. And what infinite descent is, is we go reducto ad absurdum. Well, we, we set up something so that it continues to spiral down to the absurd, to the implications that couldn't possibly be true. And so you, you take an original conjecture and you modify it and you do this long process. Um, and it gets ridiculous and so it's not true. And this was invented by the namesake of the website, Pierre de Fermat, um, and he used it to prove special cases of his famous last theorem. And we will be proving one of those in the next lecture. All right? So those are some of the proof types we'll be familiar with. Obviously, there are a few more, um, and we'll go over them as we encounter them. So the point of everything we've done today is kind of to get you used to my mathematical style, so you can see a little bit how. You saw my writing, you see the level of work I show, um, so you can get familiar with me. Um, because I often find when a teacher jumps right into mathematical lessons and you don't know what they're doing, you're focused more on understanding their work than understanding what's going on. So, I hope you've got a good feel for me, um, because I'll be here for a while, and I hope you tune back in next week, and you're interested in these mathematical lectures, and I can provide an opportunity for betterment. So, thank you guys very much for your time. Have a great day.